Recently, the European Union Parliament's representative in the Brexit negotiations, Guy Verhofstadt, gave a speech at the Liberal Democrats' party conference. It was quite something. You go. surprise we have an extra guest, somebody who's been a really good friend of Liberals and is still fighting to work for us. And I would like to invite him now onto the stage, Giva Hofstad. these. We, we look forward to seeing you wearing it around the parliament. Yeah. Well, let's watch a little bit of it, and then I'm going to see if I can analyse his argument in detail. We cannot continue. We cannot continue, dear friends, with a Europe that is always acting too little and too late. In the world order of tomorrow, the world order of tomorrow is not a world order based on nation states or countries, it's a world order that is based on empires. China is not a nation, it's a civilization, Han. India, you know it better than I do, is not a nation. There are 2,000 nations in India. There are 20 different languages that are used there. There are four big religions at the same time. It is the biggest democracy worldwide. The US is also an empire, more than a nation. Maybe tomorrow they will speak there more Spanish than English. I don't know what will happen. <laughs> and then finally, the Russian Federation. The world of tomorrow is a world of empires in which we, European and you, British, can only defend your interest, your way of life, by doing it together in a European framework and in the European Union. And those, and those, dear friends, those who want to defend our standards of living, our social standards, our ecological standards, our labor standards, can only do that. They know it only in the framework of Europe and inside Europe, in the center of Britain, that take its responsibilities and not is going out of this great project. I have to tell you, in a world where we see Putin, where we see the Chinese leadership, when we see what is happening in Hong Kong for the moment, in a world with Trump. Stop. So first of all, a little verbal trickery on Mr. Verhofstadt's part because he basically redefines the word empire to mean something like big nations. I mean, there is no real respect in which the nation of India is an empire or the nation of China is an empire in the strictest sense. They're just very large nations. So on the face of it, this looks like a geopolitical speech with security as a concern, something like China, India and Russia are big nations, so we need a common defence policy. But since NATO already exists, and since an attack on one member of NATO is an attack on all members of NATO, the Hofstad can't possibly be talking about defence, can he? That would be redundant. So instead, what he means is something like this. China, India and Russia are big nations, therefore Europe needs to integrate its economic regulations and political and legal structures, or put more elegantly, 
China, India and Russia are big nations, therefore Europe should be one big nation. Or put with a little bit more granular detail, China, India and Russia are big nations, therefore the UK, Germany, France, Spain, Netherlands, Italy and so on should be one big nation. Now whatever you make of this idea, does the logic work? Well, in order to make the argument work, we need to fill in a missing and unstated premise from Verhofstadt, and that is simply this. It's good to be big. The argument does not work unless you state this up front. And so long as this premise is included, that it's good to be big, and so long as that premise is true, his argument will be valid and holds up. So this begs the question, is it really good to be big. Well, since we know that Verhofstadt wasn't really talking in military terms because of the aforementioned NATO pact, he must have been talking in terms of economic clout. Well, here is the GDP per capita in $1990 over the past 200 years. You can see the GDP per capita of the UK, France, Netherlands, Italy and so on has consistently been bigger than the GDP per capita of China, India or Russia. Looking at these figures, one can see that since about 1950, those three countries have grown faster than the European nations, starting from a much lower base. But in the cases of China and Russia, it remains the case that their GDP per capita is less than half that of UK, France or Germany. In the case of India, much less than half. So, at least looking at these numbers, the idea that it is good to be big is not exactly borne out. Now, one could point to the growth rates of those big nations in recent years and say, hey, isn't this proof that it's good to be big? But you can see from these same numbers that Poland has grown faster than Russia since 1990. And after having extremely comparable GDP per capita numbers in 1850, Japan's GDP per capita is now more than twice that of China's. And India's growth has trailed behind Indonesia's. It's perfectly possible that all we are seeing is countries that had been stymied by communism in the process of catching up after joining the world economy. There's not much evidence at all in these numbers to suggest that big is best. With one exception, that's the USA. You can see it starting to pull ahead of the UK, for example, after the two world wars. And there could be other factors at play here than simply size. For example, the USA has freer markets and a smaller welfare state than most European countries. You can see that during the years of the socialist post-war consensus in the UK, British growth stagnated and only really picked up steam again after Margaret Thatcher was elected in 1979. The USA never had a Clement Attlee nationalising a third of its industry or a Harold Wilson introducing a 98% top rate of tax. And if we zoom out from these stats, we can see much smaller nations than the USA with even freer markets such as Hong Kong, Singapore and Switzerland have a higher GDP per capita. Switzerland, I note, is one European nation that is not in the European Union, so perhaps it benefits from not being aligned to its regulations. Ireland is one nation there that is notably also part of the EU, but of course Ireland has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in Europe. Incidentally, it's less than half the average corporate tax rate in the USA, which is currently at 25.7%. So if any Bernie Sanders voters are watching this, I hope you can see what European-style socialism really means. And so we come back to the question, is it really good to be big? As far as I can see, the jury is out on that, as the jury is out on Mr. Verhofstadt in general. Now get out.